And as you can see, we have another change in program. We are not having a cake and eating it, we are having a cookie. Please welcome Mr. Josef Svenningson. Thank you. Thank you, Mikko. Yes, so I, quite embarrassingly, when I submitted it, this talk, I gave a title that, was, that had a grammar error in it, which was uh, quite bad. Um, so I changed the title, so now it's uh, grammatically correct, but the idiom is wrong, right? Um, and I will explain why at the end of the talk. So have your cookie and eat it too. So uh, just a few notes on my affiliations here. I, I'm involved in a lot of stuff. I, I work at Chalmers a little bit, Chalmers University of Technology as a, a researcher. I'm doing that less and less. I'm only at 20% right now. Um, my, my, the rest of my time, at, I'm a consultant at HiQ, where I work at Ericsson, uh, for Ericsson. Um, I'm sorry if that's a bit of a blasphemy. I know Nokia was uh, founded uh, some way around here, so I apologize for that. Um, but I, I, I am in telecom, and so probably every single mobile in this room is talking to some bit of code that I've written as it turns out, because all of Finland is running on Ericsson, uh, uh, the Ericsson product that I'm involved in. So, yeah. Um, okay, so let's get started with this. So this is going to be a Haskell talk again, um, and I'm getting into that, but it's not going to be... Uh, I don't know what you expect from a Haskell talk. Maybe you expect weirdness, proofs, category theory, and that stuff. Uh, it's not going to be like that. Who knows who this guy is? There's one, two, maybe. Yeah, so this is John Hughes. He's a big uh, functional programming guru, especially in the Haskell world. And he wrote the paper uh, a long time ago in the 1990 called Why Functional Programming Matters. And this is kind of a manifest as to why we should be doing functional programming. How many have read this thing? Oh, it's actually quite a few people. Uh, so I guess you know a little bit about uh, John, even though uh, you didn't recognize his picture. Okay, good thing. Good thing that you've read it. So um, one of the quotes here is that when writing a modular program, uh, when writing a modular program to solve a problem, one first divides the problem into subproblems, then solves the subproblems, and finally combines the solution, right? So this is how we solve problems. We, we sort of destruct it, and then we glue them together. And the, the manifest that John has in this paper is that we should do programming in that style also, and that functional programming provides a really good means of subdividing and then gluing together. So I want to take the first couple of minutes here and talk about some of the examples that he uses. Uh, so that we can look a little bit uh, at this technique. So um, the, the examples that he used in the paper uh, is a couple of numerical algorithms. So he starts by uh, a very toy example. So these are all toy examples, and it's because it's in a small paper. You cannot write large programs there in order to be effective. Uh, you want to fit the code in the paper. So he, he, he wants to... Um, yeah, he uses Newton Raphson to find the roots uh, of um, the square root. And the Newton Raphson method computes a series of approximations. Um, and the way he does that, he, he captures that notion, a series of approximation, and represents that as a list. Okay, so these series of approximation, they turn up to an actual list. And so then he uses uh, the function iterate in Haskell, which, uh, so what does, it, what does it do? Well, it takes two arguments. It takes a function, and it takes an element, and then he, it returns the first element, and then it recurses, so the rest of the element will be iterate, but we've applied F once, and so this means that we will get, uh, as we go along the list, further and further applications of F to A. So first we just get A, then we get F of A, F of F of A, and so on. And the next function is the thing that does newton raphson on um, uh, for, for the square root. And so if we want to compute the, the approximations, here's how we can do it. 
I should just say, yeah, I'm, I'm using Haskell here, right? So if, if you have any questions about the syntax or any other weirdness, just, just shout to me, and I'll try and explain it. But I'll, I'll try and do that anyways as I go. But, but uh, I know not everyone here is a Haskeller. OK. I, here's, a, here's a fact about Haskell that I bet no one of you knows. It's actually Hebrew for wisdom. Do you need any more reason to program in Haskell? Just saying. Just saying. OK, so yeah, so back to the example. So we've, we've computed uh, a series of approximation. OK, so what, what can we do with that then? So we have to decide somehow when, when it's good enough, these approximations are good enough. And so we can write the function within, within epsilon um, that goes through the list, and so you have it, it looks at the first two elements of the list, A and B. So I'm not using the, the pointer here because you're not seeing it anyway. So I'm trying to reach up here, but the screen is quite big. OK, so we look at A and B, the first two. And, and if the difference is smaller than epsilon, then we've come at our a good, va good enough value. Otherwise, we're going to keep going further down the list. Ooh, that should be not cons, but it should be the colon. Sorry about that. That's a typo. OK, so then we can arrive at our square root function, uh, which takes an initial approximation, an epsilon, and then the number that we want to square root. And we can uh, design this function by means of, of composing these general functions. So within epsilon, we iterate the next function on the initial um, uh, approximation, the, the initial value that we start with. So, so, this is, so this is his first example of how we can subdivide the problem and then compose it together. We, we get a few functions. And then he, he goes on to do another, uh, another couple of uh, numerical algorithms in the paper. So we can do similar things with numerical differentiation. So we have the uh, easy diff is the formula for differentiation. And we can, uh, we can apply that. Um, to um, yes, so we, we start by by the initial uh, h zero, and then we sort of subdivide it, and then we can apply the easy diff uh, on that uh, using the map function, which just applies this function in this case easy diff to each element of the list of approximations. Um, and it's the same thing there. We get a list of approximations, and so we want to pick the one that, we, that is good enough. So we can use the within epsilon function that we def defined before. And so now we get a differentiate function, which is very similar to the one that we had before. Uh, we're reusing within, we're using, reusing iterate, but we've given it different uh, arguments. And so um, we, we get reuse, and, uh, but yeah. So we can compose these very general uh, reusable functions to get these kind of things. Uh, another example is with, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this is not another example. This is um, a, a further refinement on the differentiation. So with a little bit of clever math, you can actually, because the problem with this previous one is that it converges very slowly. So, um, and one problem is that you get the, the error term when you do that. I'm not going to go into the math, but the thing is that you can, with some clever math, you can create an improved method that will make it converge even faster. And so you can just slide that into the whole pipeline of things here. Um, so you can compositionally just improve what you've already written by just sliding in this function in a compositional manner, which is quite nice. Um, and uh, you can do the same thing with uh, numerical integration. And I will not, not go into all the details here, uh, just to say that we can, again, reuse the within and improve in this case to get uh, uh, better results. So the, yeah, the, the basic uh, idea here is that we should, we should write our programs by composing reusable functions. Um, this is a quite nice way of programming. And it's, th it's something that I strive to use. Even though I don't write numerical algorithms, I write other kinds of programs. And I try to use this mindset. And I hope you all do as well. What I've just shown you was not a, 
an attempt at convincing you that this is the right way to do it. I hope you already do it. But I want to I talk about another question about this thing. Uh, what happens with efficiency? If we look at this square root function, this, is, uh, uh, this, this cannot be efficient, right? I mean, in particular, we have, so iterate returns a list and then within sort of consumes it. And, but the, the final result is, has nothing to do with lists, right? So this is an intermediate data structure that just be allocates and deallocates. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's not there for the final result. So, so, so that's really inefficient, right? And we know that in particular because this is a numerical algorithm that we can do much better than this. But, but we still want to program in this style, right? So, so there's a tension there. Yeah, so, so when we program in this compositional manner, this leads to these intermediate data structures. And yeah, as I just said, they, it's, it's costly. And, and it also hinders other optimizations that we might want to do on this uh, program. So the, the solution to this is fusion. This is the technique that I'm going to talk about today. And it's a... Uh, it's an optimization that can uh, remove intermediate data structures. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to start by talking about a particular uh, flavor called stream fusion that's particularly popular in the Haskell community. So the general idea here with stream fusion is that you should Take the lists that you have. So this is mainly for list programming, although I'll, I'll get to other applications uh, later. You encode your lists as, as streams, and then you merge the com uh, conversions between the lists and the streams. And then it turns out that these stream functions are non-recursive and very simple to inline and optimize. And so essentially, you, you write the program in a form that is very amenable for the compiler to just uh, chunk away at and uh, create a very efficient program in the end, despite you having written it in a compositional style. Okay, let's go into examples. So first of all, this stream that we're talking about, this is how it's defined, or this is a simplified version, the, the, the simplest form of stream uh, that you could have in this case. So, so this is a data type declaration. Um, and I'll, I'll go through it because it's, it's quite important for this talk. So the, the top line just defines the name of the type. And then we have, on the second line, stream, the first, which is a constructor, or it's just an atom, uh, but it will have two arguments of a particular type that creates the stream data type. So the first argument is a function from s to step of a s. Uh, I'll get into step in a moment, and then an s, and then we get, we get the stream type from that. So the s here is meant to be an internal state in the stream. So it's not something that you use. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't appear up on the first row there. It's, it's a type that's sort of internal to the stream, that, that whenever you construct the stream, you can choose what the internal state should be like. Much, much like, so this is a kind of a functional uh, way of encoding objects, if you will. So, uh, so the, the, the second argument there, the S, is the initial state that we have for this stream. OK, and the first argument is a function from that state to, to a step. So what's the step? Well, that's what, uh, that's what we have here, uh, the second data type. A step can be two things. It can either yield, uh, so it yields an element in the stream. So we get a new element, yay. And we get a new state. Uh, so that, that's what we can get. So the state might now have changed since we generated the new element. Um, or we're just done and then we don't get anything. OK? OK. Shout if there's any confusion here. Right, so now we want to program with uh, this a little bit and see what we can do. So, uh, so here's an example program that we might want to uh, write on this. This is mapping, just applying a function on each element of the stream, a common thing that you might want to do. So. Yeah, so given a stream uh, with 
a next function and an initial state, we, we create a new stream with uh, a new sort of uh, next function. Uh, but we keep the, the same initial state. That's, that turns out to be what we want in this case. And the new, uh, the new function for computing the next element looks like this. So, so we start, so, so we get a piece of state here, um, which is going to be the same as, as the input uh, stream. So we're just going to apply the, the, the stepper function from the input stream and see what that yields. Okay? And if, if that stream, the input stream was done, then we're also done because we, we want to apply our function to elements of the list, but there were no others, so we're, we're just done as well. But if we got an element x, then we, we want to return that x after we've applied f to it. So that's what happens here. Um, and then we're going to keep the, um, uh, the same state. OK, so, so here's an example of, of a function. And one thing to, to note about this definition is that it's non-recursive. So map stream is not recursive. Next map is not recursive. And this is good, because recursion is hard for compilers to work with, um, and optimize in particular. So uh, what we've done now is make this whole non-recursive and simple to inline. And we'll see how that works in a few minutes. OK, so then we can convert from list to streams. And uh, here's how we can do that. Um, so we get an input list, x is 0, uh, which is going to be our initial state in the stream. And then we have this stepper function there that's going to go through the list and create the stream of the same elements. And it's, it's sort of a very basic conversion. So whenever we see the empty list, we're done. Uh, no more in the stream. But if we see an element x followed by another uh, list, then we yield that x. And the, the rest of the list will now become our, our new state. So we're going to consume that list. OK, again, completely unrecursive. Super good. And then we have a function unstream which converts backwards. So it takes a stream and returns a list. <clears throat> and it sort of uh, folds over the stream. But here's, uh, here's what's interesting. This function is actually recursive. So you cannot completely escape recursion here. Um, so unfold here is, you know, it's defined here. And yeah, here's the recursive call. So you cannot get away from that. Uh, but as we shall see, that's, that's all right. That's all right. I will not go through the details of this function. Uh, unless someone wants to. So, so then we can take our list function, map f, and define it in terms of these uh, primitives. Uh, unstream, map, stream, f, stream. Okay? This is now, so, so remember, stream takes a list and, return, and, and creates a stream. That goes into the map stream, and then you convert back to a list. What have we really gained here? What, why? <laughs> that seems very roundabout way of doing it. OK, wh why? So OK, everything at once here. OK, so, so let's look at what happens now if we have a map f of map g of xs, the top there. So we're composing two maps. This is an artificial example. But it's, it's meant to be simple so that we can actually fit it on the slide. OK, so what I'm going to do here for the first, so if we have, have map composed with map, then what I've done for the, for the second uh, row there is I've just inlined the definitions of map, both of them. And so we get, so we get this humongous thing, the unstream, map, stream, stream, unstream, map, stream, stream, excess. OK, but the interesting thing here is that we get stream unstream. So we get a conversion from, from list, from a, from, a, uh, from a stream to a list to a, and back to a stream. And this seems very unnecessary, right? And so what if we could remove that and just say, bam, let's remove that. So then we get um, Unstream, map stream, map stream, stream. OK? And then remember, these uh, map stream, 
and stream, they were all uh, non-recursive functions, so they were very easy to inline to, into the, for the compiler. So here's a few steps that the compiler will go through once it sees this, this thing. So yeah, so it will, um, it will inline the stream, and then it will inline the, the, the first map stream, and it will get something like this. And then it will continue to simplify things here. Oh, it gets a case of a case. Uh, it gets a little bit complicated. It, it sort of does a little bit of magic. Oh, right. So, so in this case of case here, it actually can see that, ah, uh, the result can either be done or yield, and then we're just casing on it right outside, so we don't actually need to do that. We can actually shortcut that. And, and so the compiler knows how to do that and just, bam, uh, uh, short circuits that, which is an important part of this. But this is all standard. And then it goes on and inlines and do these transformations, and bang, we get this... Uh, no, we, we're not quite done here. We, we still have the on stream, but, but we've made quite some, some headway here. Um, and then once we uh, also inline on stream and, and expand its definition, in the end, what we will get is this, uh, which is an unfold, which is directly recursive, which applies f and g to each element. And yay! So this is exactly what we wanted, right? We wanted a recursive uh, function that didn't have any intermediate um, data. No intermediate list, no intermediate streams whatsoever. And so there was a uh, quite a long uh, you know, derivation of what the compiler does. And it's really boring for us uh, humans to read that kind of thing. But the point is that all of these transformations, except for the first step, that I talked about, they were all standard. The compiler knows how to do that. The Haskell compiler does that all the time. Every time you compile with the O flag, it will, it will just do that. So, so, yeah. So the key was, step was to remove these stream on stream pairs. And then the compiler will take care of the rest, and the final result is a single efficient recursive function uh, so that we could actually you know, get efficient code even though we wrote in a compositional matter even though it was a trivial example in this case. So, so we can do this, this same thing. Uh, this is just to, to uh, show you that it works on more examples than one. So we can do exactly the same thing with the, with the examples that are in the Why Functional Programming Matters paper. We can define the, uh, the iterate function in a stream fashion. Uh, it's the step function always always yields. It's never done because it's an infinite list. That, uh, yeah, that's the kind of thing that we do in Haskell. And then you can also do the within stream that just com uh, consumes a stream. And so this one turns all out to be also recursive. The go to function here you can see is recursive. And so it turns out that functions that com con consumes streams. Uh, without producing a new one, they're always recursive. So that's the pattern. The other ones are not recursive. Uh, but OK, so we can write these and the others as uh, these things. And uh, we can go through the same thing. So we had this, this annoying program that we looked at where we had the intermediate list. And boom, 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 we let the compiler do its work. And we get uh, the following program in the end when we're done with uh, using the definitions that I showed in the previous slide. All right, great, great. This is, uh, we can program in a compositional style and, and uh, get efficient definitions out of this. Um, <clears throat> so, but now you might be wondering how, how general is this technique? So it turns out not, not all functions can be written in a, in a way that um, they can be fused. Okay, not, not every list function that you can think up can be written as a stream function that uh, will fuse eventually. So here are two examples, like the reverse function that will just take a list and reverse it. Um, because suppose that you had composed two reverses, reverse composed with reverse. Uh, if you could fuse that, then it, it would, yeah, it would be essentially nothing. Everything would be gone. But that would not be correct in all instances, because in Haskell, lists can be infinite. And if you do reverse reverse on an infinite list, you get non-termination. And if you, 
if you manage to fuse that, you remove non-termination. So that's, uh, you're not preserving correctness anymore. You're inventing something else. Concat map is another function that I will not go into, but uh, I, well, I will, I will get back to it in a second. But what we can do with the reverse is that we can do uh, uh, a little bit, yeah, uh, anyways. So we can write this reverse stream that takes a stream and returns a reversed list. Okay? So, so we can actually, uh, yeah. So the essence is this uh, Go function, which has an accumulator, which is the list that we want to produce in the end. And so we're, uh, um, uh, we, we invoke the, the stream uh, and look at the result. And if we get one, we, we const the A on the accumulator and continue with the new state S prime and just recurse like that until we're done. And this will, this will, uh, and once we're done, we return the accumulator and that will uh, result in a reversed list. And then we can define our reverse on list as, you know, stream X excess and then uh, do a reverse stream. And then that stream can pair with another unstream uh, that we compose this thing with. And so the, th the thing that uh, w we need a way to talk about these kind of functions that are, you know, we can fuse them in one way but not another. And so the, the nomenclature that, that uh, people have come up with is that reverse is a good consumer but not a good producer. Okay? So this is a way for uh, library writers who write libraries that are fusion enabled uh, to communicate to the programmers when they can expect fusion and when they cannot expect fusion. Okay? So, <clears throat> so essentially, how can we be sure that the intermediate uh, data structure has been removed? Well, as I said, a good consumer is a function which consumes a list using the stream function. Okay? And likewise, a good producer is a function which uh, produces a list using the unstream function. Okay? And so the guarantee is then that whenever these two meet, uh, if you have a good consumer that consumes something that were produced by a good producer, then these, this, you get this stream unstream pair, and they can be uh, removed, and the compiler can go to work, just as we saw in the previous examples. Few should happens. OK? So. So this is the rule that we, we would like to have to teach to the compiler, the stream unstream. This was what unlocked the, the fusion to happen in the first case. OK, so how can we teach that to the compiler? Well, it turns out the Haskell compiler is, is, uh, has a really nice feature for this. You just write like this. So it has a, a pragma called rules that lets you teach it new optimization rules. So, uh, so what this means is that, well, you say rules, and then a string is just the name of the rule, so that for debugging purposes, the op optimizer can say when it applied this, this uh, rewrite rule. And then for all s is just to say that s is, is a variable that is not, it's not a function that is defined somewhere else. It's just a local variable here. So for any s, then uh, stream applied to unstream of S should just be S. And now we've had, we're now our library is fusion enabled. Like that. I think this is a pretty uh, neat feature. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, how, how can it be this simple? Um, and this could be a whole talk in itself. And I'm, I'm glad we had the, the previous talk that talked about reasoning in Haskell and so forth. It's, uh, implementing this kind of thing in any other language would be uh, quite hard. And one of the problems is that you have to make sure that you don't mess with um, side effects. Um, and uh, because you're, you would reorder how things happen when you start uh, inlining and fusing things. And so that would not be correct. And so uh, ha this is where Haskell's kind of weird purity. I know a lot of people think of it as you know a straitjacket, like oh you can't you can't do with this and that whenever you want. But there's a payoff to it in certain cases. In the in the previous talk, 
it was that you know we could reason about programs if we if we wrote them in a certain style in the functional style. Um, we can reason about them much more simply. Here, we're using that. You know, we also have a law here. Uh, in a sense, you can call this a mathematical law. The this one, uh, but we're using it for for optimization purposes, right? So we, we're taking it a step further. I mean, ideally, we should prove this law so that it is actually holds. I'm not going to get into that, but but once we've done that, we can also use it to teach the compiler new optimization tricks. So yeah. Uh, but this slide is basically a talk in itself, so yeah. All right. So, so let me just summarize what uh, what you would have to do in Haskell in order to have or enable Fusion for your library. So you would start out. Um, you you write a library and you use it. You use the streaming functions in that library to define all the functions, like map that we had before, like iterate or within. You know, all of these, they have to be defined in terms of these streaming functions, OK? And then you document to the user exactly where these things are used, like where are you good consumers, where are you good producers, so that you can communicate to the, to the user of the library where you expect Fusion to happen, or where he can expect Fusion to happen. And then you teach the compiler to optimize these stream on stream pairs. And then um, the last two bullet points is for the, the user the, or the user programmer who wants to use the library um, and program in a compositional manner and still get efficiency. So uh, that programmer, he will, he will use the library that is Fusion enabled um, and he will, he will make sure that he, he composes these good good consumers and good producers, and then, you know, it, it will be efficient nonetheless, even though it programs in a compositional style. So that's basically the story for that. And there are, there are actually a couple of libraries in Haskell that uses this. Uh, there are more than, than the ones that I mentioned here, but uh, anyways. So there, <clears throat> the ones that I want to mention, uh, first of all, is Pipes and Conduit, which are two major libraries for uh, doing stream processing, uh, it could be I/O, it could be whatever you have, um, and they're they're quite popular for whenever you need to do some kind of streaming thing. Uh, the the Fusion framework in those are is more complicated because it deals with uh, more cases than the ones that I've shown here, but um, they have some uh, Fusion guarantees, uh, so you can compose these uh, sort of pipelines of streaming computations quite freely and still uh, know that this will, this will uh, be quite efficient. Uh, there are also libraries like the text library and the bystring library. So these are two types of strings in Haskell. So text is for Unicode, and byte string is for just bytes, uh, strings of bytes. And they both use this uh, fusion technique also for many of the functions. Uh, so again, this encourages a compositional style uh, without the side effect of, of inefficiency, if you will. <clears throat> All right. So one thing that I'm I'm, I'm not going to talk about this. I'm just going to I'm just going to tease you with it. Is that the standard list library in Haskell doesn't actually use stream fusion. It uses another form of fusion called folder build that I'm not going to go into. And the reason is is uh, essentially the concat map function that I talked about previously, which is hard and it's it's it takes a long time to explain why it doesn't work and uh, yeah. So uh, I'm not going to go into that. But the important thing, why concat map is important, is because it, it's important for implementing list comprehensions in Haskell. So uh, a lot of languages have list comprehensions these days, but uh, Haskell has them too, and uses concat map to desugar them. So here's just an example of a Cartesian product using uh, uh, list comprehensions. So that's that. But I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to leave it at that, actually, and do a little interlude. So I don't know. OK, so here's another guy that you can, uh, I don't know if you know. Who is this? Phil Wadler, that's right. Who, who knows about Phil Wadler? Yeah, quite a few. This is actually his 60th birthday. Um, and I don't know, this is not a very good picture, I'm sorry, but, but he's dressed as Lambda Man. 
which is, you know, a blue dress, I mean, kind of like Superman, but with a lambda on his chest. Um, I think we should all aspire to have a 60th birthday like that. You know, when you're dressed like your own created comic book character, right? And, uh, you know, <laughs> if this guy isn't, uh, you know, enthusiastic about functional programming, I don't know who is. So, <laughs> yeah. Phil Wadler, he wrote a paper uh, back in the days uh, called Deforestation. How many of you know about this thing? Uh, a few, a few. So this was actually the original solution to the problem that I talked about. Um, and, well, you can, you can see in the subtitle here, you know, transforming programs to eliminate trees. It's a, it's a very funny title in a sense. I mean, you, you can... Uh, <laughs> a friend of mine told me, actually it was John Hughes who told me, the, the guy back in the slides, uh, that he, he had tried to do reverse searches on this paper, deforestation, and it ended up with, you know, people doing actual deforestation, you know, like, like researching deforestation in forests and stuff like that. They had linked to this paper and they were like, you know, you could imagine them like reading this and yeah, it's, it's kind of theoretical, you know, but yeah, he seems to be, you know, I interested in this stuff anyway, so mm, yeah, maybe. So <clears throat> Anyway, it's not about that. It's about eliminating these intermediate data structures that are sometimes trees, sometimes lists, you know? So anyway, um, uh, let's see. So, so yeah, so, so this was really exciting, actually. And there was, uh, you know, uh, some work on this. There was the deforestation paper. There was uh, uh, a guy called Simon Marlowe that you may or may not know about. He did his PhD thesis on, on doing this, and he tried to implement it in the Haskell compiler, but it didn't quite work out. And then there was a, a bunch of other work in the 90s. Uh, but, but uh, yeah, it sort of petered out. Then there's this other transformation that you often hear on, on the internet uh, every now and then when you talk about uh, optimization like this, and this is supercompilation. How many of you, have you heard of supercompilation? Yeah, a few, a few, okay. I just, um, I just wanna say a few things. So this was invented by a guy in, in a Russian in the 80s. And uh, this is a very powerful transformation, much more powerful than deforestation. And no one understood it, basically, so he was quite alone. But then in the 90s, there were a group of Danish people who tried to understand it. And they, you know, they explained it, and they improved it, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then there was a lot, you know, in the, uh, maybe 10 years ago, there was a lot of interest in starting again in supercompilation, because they thought, yeah, we need to really get this working. And there was, uh, you know, a guy called Neil Mitchell who did this, this is a PhD thesis again. Uh, Peter Jonsson is another guy who did his thesis on this. And uh, Max Bolingbroke, who also did his PhD on these things. But nothing came of this thing. So, <sighs> Um, what, I'm, what I'm basically saying here is that these, these are really powerful techniques. They do a sort of whole program transformation, but they fail to provide a, uh, a practical implementation. And it's frustrating because they seem to be so, so um, powerful, but it's, it's really hard to, to implement them well. And the basic problem is that they, they start unfolding and they they do inlining, and they don't care if, if functions are, are recursive or not. And so if you have a function, so here's one from Phil Wadler's paper, where you have flip of flip, which just takes a tree and flips all the, all the branches, just like this. And if you do that twice, you should get the identity function, or nothing should happen, basically. So T there stands for transform this program. So it starts by transforming flip of flip of some tree, and then it gets to this point here where it says, yeah, it, it's some case expression, and it sort of figure out the leaf case that it shouldn't do anything, right? And in the branch case, it gets this T of flip flip and T of flip flip again. And that's basically the same thing as we have up there. And so in order not to go on indefinitely here, it's important that we stop unfolding and figure out that we should create a new recursive function, just like the one that we get here. So this is the result that we need to get. But this step here, actually inventing a new recursive function, is actually really, really hard to do well. And um, it, it, you know, it needs a lot of memory because it needs to see all the steps it has taken before. And um, it's, it has to be conservative in order to terminate and, and whatnot. So, so this is really the limiting factor of these things. Oh, so um, 
Yeah, so this is basically, th so these are really nice techniques, but they don't actually work in practice, where there's the fusion stuff that I've been talking about, it, it actually works, and it's used in, in many places. How am I doing for time? Good, okay, e excellent. Um, all right, so, so yeah, I've, I've basically, so this step is very similar, or, or, or on a superficial level, it's similar in deforestation, supercompilation anyway. So, so I, I, I've lost faith in these techniques, basically. Uh, that's, that's what I'm saying, I guess. So, uh, to finish off, I want to talk about another kind of uh, fusion, array fusion. And so streaming fusion, it works on one element at a time, sort of, and they come in a sort of a predefined order. And that doesn't work out when you want to do other kinds of numerical algorithms, like on arrays, for example, where you want to have random access. And so we need a new model for how to do fusion on these things. Okay? And so, I w so this is something that we did, and I want to talk a little bit about this. Uh, uh, so uh, we, didn't, we didn't necessarily invent this, but we used it to great effect in what's called the Felspar project that I was, that I was part on. It was a collaboration between Ericsson and, and Chalmers and, and uh, LT University in Hungary. And um, I just want to say a few things about Felspar. It was a domain-specific language for, for doing signal processing that aimed at raising the, the level of abstraction for, for uh, you know, a low-level programming. Um, and it, it was essentially a trimmed down version of Haskell, so I will still be using Haskell here, but the ideas are taken from the, the Felspar project. Um, and yeah, and we used Fusion in order to uh, basically allow low level programming uh, to be written in a compositional style. So the, the fundamental model that we used here was the, uh, what we call the pull array. And here's how you can define it in Haskell. And so it has, it has two components. Uh, the last one is the size of the array, the int there. And the first one is a function from index to an element. OK? So that means that whenever you give it an index, it will give you, the function will return the element at that index. So if you give it a 1, it will, give, it will return the element at the index 1. Two, and so on. So, so this is a quite simple model, right? You just model arrays as function from index to element, okay? But it turns out to be very effective when you want to do uh, fusion. So, uh, so then we have to write our um, uh, uh, new functions on these pull arrays. So we can define, for instance, map that we've seen before. Uh, we can define that. So if, if we're given a, a pull array with an index function and a size, um, like the one here. So I, I, I call this x is the index function that, that given an index returns uh, uh, the element. OK. So we can construct a new pull array here by just composing uh, the index function with the, the function that we want to apply to each element in the array. Uh, so that turns out to be very simple. Sip with takes two pull arrays and pairwise applies a function so that you get a, a, a new pull array as well. So you have two, and then you just sort of side by side and then apply this function on each one. So you sort of sip them together and you get one uh, array like that. And then you can also sum a, a function. And you get a similar situation with the with the, as with the stream, that when you consume a pull array without producing a new one, then you get a recursive function. So you get this uh, recursive function here as well. Yeah, so, uh, so we can do a bunch of uh, uh, functions on this. And uh, one difference, as I said, is that this is now random access. So we can have a lookup function that just computes the element at a particular index. And that is just applying the index function to that index. Uh, and so we can choose our index whatever we like. And this is not possible in the, uh, in the stream uh, world. So this is a clearly a, a very different model. OK, so let me just, let me just show you one more example of uh, uh, fusion. So uh, I will take as an example the dot product. So what, how, what's, what's the definition of a dot product? Anyone remembers? 
Well, you take two vectors that were represented as array. Take two vectors, you, uh, you element-wise uh, multiply them together. So each element of them, you multiply together, and then you sum the result. Okay? Do you remember that from linear algebra? So th this description that I have now, this is very compositional description, I think, because we, st we, we first do the pairwise uh, multiplication, or the, the element-wise multiplication, and then we sum it. So yeah, that's basically what I said. So um, here's how we can uh, implement that using the functions that I showed you before. So that's how I like to write the dot product. And uh, then what happens when we do the fusion? Well, we start out with the dot product, and then we inline it. And then uh, we know that x and y are pull arrays. So we're just going to use the fact that we know what form they have. Pull arrays are always on this form. And so then we can just expand the definition of zip width, right? So a few slides before, we saw the definition of zip width was just a new pull array. So we're just going to inline that definition. And uh, now we have some applied to a pool, and that we, we also saw that, that definition. So we can just inline that definition as well. And this is the final program that we get. We get an expression, go 0, 0, and then it will, it will sort of, so I, the first argument is, is the index that's going to be increased, and the s is the running sum. And uh, then it's, it's going to use the, the sizes of the x and y's to, to see when it's done, and it's going to use the index functions from the x and the y uh, vectors to uh, compute the elements. And so uh, what has happened here is that, again, we've removed, I mean, there was no intermediate array here. There's no allocation involved in any, uh, in any way. And if we know the definition of xfx and xfy, we can also inline them, and uh, uh, maybe there are memory references, what do I know? But, but uh, this would be a very efficient uh, algorithm in the end. So again, we've managed to write in a compositional style and still get an efficient uh, definition out of it. So th in Feldspar, we choose a little bit different library design than the one that I talked about before. Uh, we, we force the programmers to work directly with pull arrays. Um, so there was no sort of implicit conversion uh, like we had in the streaming be between the stream and unstream. So you didn't, when programmed there, you didn't know about the, the streaming. You only know, knew about good, and, uh, good producers and good consumers. But we, we chose to force people to work in pull arrays uh, explicitly and then do the conversion explicitly and allocate and so forth. And that was because it gets a little harder to um, uh, program in this style, but it also gets harder to make performance errors. And so we targeted programs, programmers that are quite um, uh, yeah, aware of, you know, they want to have efficient programs, so they're um, performance aware. And so that's why we chose this design. So that's another sort of point in the design space, if you wish, when you, when you want to use Fusion. So <coughs> You can use this uh, to, to do quite wonderful things, like you know, we implement FFT, and you have these beautiful butterfly networks that you can write compositionally. And uh, so th there's a very nice recursive structure to this that you can use. Um, so th these are three stages in an FFT, for instance. I mean, you have this, this big step, and then you have the next step, which happens at two places where you get this butterfly, and then you do the butterfly. Uh, in each pair here. And, but all of these have a similar sort of uh, flavor in that you take, you take the top ones and the, the bottom inputs, and then you sort of f fold them together and, and um, uh, do this, this uh, two um, pairwise discrete uh, Fourier transform, and then you sort of expand them again. And you can, you can write this quite nicely in, uh, in Feldspar. Uh, like this. There's a bunch of junk here that I, I'm not going to talk about. The point is that this was our actual, this is from our actual FFT implementation, and, and we, could, we could write in this style with this long composition with a lot of intermediate uh, arrays here, and it would still generate very efficient code, and so that was very pleasing. 
And so one of the biggest things that we did in the Felspar pro uh, project was to implement this. Um, uh, does anyone recognize what this is? I guess not. So whenever your mobile phone, so this mobile phone has an antenna that sends stuff to another antenna that's somewhere around here. And this is the algorithm that does the receiving part of uh, the mobile phone station. There's a whole bunch of things going on here, like, you know, you have the input data, and then this bit here that's in dark gray, it, it does a channel estimation. It looks at the channel and sees, uh, okay, do we have some kind of distortion here? Should we account for that? What not? So, and um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, magic going on there. And then you have the, the decoding that's going on here, that's you know an inverse FFT and blah, 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 and then turbo decoding, which is a uh, error correcting code and uh, stuff like that. And so, <clears throat> yeah, so this is a lot of uh, numerical computation and quite uh, performance sensitive stuff. And so, uh, actually, so I was part in designing Felspar. So I did, I, when we first tried this out, I didn't take part in writing this. We had some guys at Ericsson do it, some research programmers, uh, research engineers there, uh, who were completely new to Felspar. And they, they implemented this stuff, or a, sort of a prototype of this, and, and to try out Felspar. And that was quite a, a nice uh, experiment. And the results were actually that we beat the production code at Ericsson. And the main factor that, that uh, the Ericsson guys uh, identified was fusion that they had um, decided to uh, factor the code up in a certain way. So they tried to mimic the C uh, code that they had, um, but they made some decisions in splitting things up in, in a couple of different functions. And in C, you don't get any fusion, whereas in Felspar, you did. And so, boom, you, you got uh, an order of, I think, 20 or 30% speed up, even with our first version of our compiler. So that was, that was super exciting, actually. So <clears throat> this is what, so they had an internal presentation at Ericsson, and uh, so uh, this, this research engineer, he <laughs> said these wonderful things about Felspar. Like he was, initially he was very skeptical, but then he was, at the end of this uh, tryout, he was completely sold. He was like, Felspar allows you to think greater thoughts. It's like, oh, functional programming for the win. Like this was amazing. And then, and then here comes the real, uh, Felspar allows one allows to have one's cookie and eat it too, right? Uh, so, yeah, this was his quote. So, yeah, you could write in this very high-level fashion and uh, still get the performance out of it. This is how you can write your, have, your, have your cookie and eat it too. So we were very pleased with these things. So do you think what happened to Felsbar after this? Discarding. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no one uses it, of course. <laughs> yeah. Ah, you've been in telecom. Yeah, you know how these things go. Yeah. All right. So yeah, I'm gonna wrap up now. So, uh, so fusion is is really wonderful, and it can remove the intermediate. This it can remove intermediate data structures and turn these compositional programs into efficient programs. And it does not automatically improve any program the way deforestation or supercompilation tries to do it, which tries to automatically just uh, handle everything that, that uh, comes into the compiler. Instead, the program must be a, a little bit performance aware and use the fusion labeled libraries. So it's something for a little bit the, the performance aware programmer. And I've shown you that there are several forms of, of fusion. There are more forms than what I've shown you here. Um, and they have different pros and cons. Um, so there's lots, of you, there's lots of literature for you to read in if you're interested in this, and I'm happy to provide pointers if you want. And in the end, you can have your cookie and eat it too. Thank you. All right, thank you, Josef. Any questions? I think we are minus 15 minutes or something. Oh, there is one question. There's one? Miss the microphone. Thank you. This was really interesting. Uh, just was wondering, uh, this sounds like that there are in 
other languages also there are similar attempts to uh, capture streams and, and, and combining their com com composing their uh, operations. Uh, are you aware of, of those in closure or, or so that? Uh, are, and are the, the other languages using fusion, for example, to do this? Sorry, are you saying who, who is using fusion? Or? Uh, are, the, do you, are you aware of, of other programming languages that, that would combine, combine the stream operations with fusion? No, I'm not. I, so I looked into the transducer stuff in Clojure just to see if there's anything like this going on. And I mean, so, so the, the transducers would be, I think, amenable to a technique like this. Uh, I, I'm afraid I don't know enough Clojure to, to know if it's, uh, you know, how one would actually do it. But, uh, you know, as far as I understand, the Clojure compiler doesn't really do any optimizations either. Uh, is that correct? I, that's, that's what I understand anyways. But, but I, I think, uh, at least in theory, you sh should be able to use these kind of techniques to, the, uh, to that library. Uh, but I'm, I'm not aware of any other uh, language that uses this. And, and as I said, part of the problem is that most other languages don't have the purity. So they have a lot of side effects. And uh, so then it's quite hard to to do this correctly, you might have to do effect inference and uh, whatnot to make sure, or you just live dangerously and just, yeah, wreck the program. <laughs> Thank you. All right, any more? Uh, as far as I understand, like, the transducers sort of do this manually, or the idea is just you just compose the functions and and then you can just reduce the initial list. So that gets rid of the intermediate lists in another way. Okay. Okay. I don't see any hands, which means the presentation is over. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>